Okay, hello, welcome back to another installment of MA341. This installment is supposed to be for Wednesday, March 25th, um, but I'm recording it in the evening beforehand. So I did go into the university to get my super duper chalk. Uh, let's break into that. I have to, uh, you know, always have to test for coronavirus. Here we go. No, no, it's clean. Okay, good. I hope everyone's doing well. We're doing fine out here. Uh, let's see if I can get that a little bit closer. Okay, so last time we were discussing infinite series. So let me just remind you, right? So you have a sequence xn, and then we say that. The series that it generates converges let's say to L um, if a certain sequence S sub K converges to L where S sub K is the sequence of so-called partial sums, so those would be the sum from n equals 1 up to k of x n. Okay? So that's what a series is. All right? And uh, since the convergence of a series just amounts to the convergence of a particular sequence, uh, and since the convergence of a sequence just amounts to determining whether or not that sequence is Cauchy, right? So that's an equivalent condition, a sequence is convergent, if and only if it's Cauchy. Um, then we can ask, what does the Cauchy criterion look like for series? So that's the next thing we'll do. Cauchy criterion. Right? So that will say that our series converges that converges to L if and only if uh, the associated whoops, the associated sequence of partial sums is Cauchy if and only if um, for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a capital N of epsilon, a natural number, such that such that what? Such that the distance say S sub K minus S sub L between elements of the sequence of partial sums is less than epsilon if both k and l are greater or equal to this capital N of epsilon. Okay? So there's nothing fancy there. That's just us translating what it means for a sequence to be Cauchy into the particular setting and notation of an infinite series, okay? So what we're gonna do now is unpack exactly what this expression means here, okay? So we have that statement, right, that S sub K minus S sub L, that's less than epsilon if and only if, and here so 1 of K or L is the bigger of the two. I'll just assume that K is bigger than L, okay? 
So if and only if, well, I can write down exactly what this expression means in terms of elements of the original generating sequence, right? So this is true if and only if. What will this be? Well, it's going to be xk plus xk minus 1 plus dot 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 plus all the way down to x sub, I guess, L plus 1. And that will be less than epsilon. Okay? Right? Because this S sub k is the sum of all the xn's from 1 up to k. And this is the sum of all the xn's from 1 up to L. So you're basically taking all the xn's from 1 up to k and throwing away the first L of them. And this is what you're left with. Okay? So that's the Cauchy criterion for a series. Uh, let's see. Okay, so um, we would like to know, of course, various conditions under which you can guarantee that a series converges. Um, so here is one relatively straightforward one based on the monotone convergence theorem. Theorem. So suppose that uh, all of the xn's are greater than or equal to zero, then The series for xn converges if and only if the partial sums are bounded. Okay, so that's my claim. That if you have a sequence of non-negative numbers and you try to form the series, you will be able to tell if it converges or not by looking, of course, at the partial sums and then looking in particular at whether or not they are bounded. So let's see why that's the case. Proof uh, note that, and this is the main point, the sequence of partial sums S sub K is increasing. Since, why is that the case? Well, S sub k plus 1 is just equal to S sub k plus x k plus 1. And x sub k plus 1 is greater than or equal to 0, right? So you get each subsequent term in the sequence of partial sums from the preceding one by adding something non-negative. That means that the sequence of partial sums is increasing, right? <clears throat> Thus, SK, and hence, by definition, the series for XN converges if and only if the SK are bounded, 
right? That's the monotone convergence theorem. A monotone sequence is convergent if and only if it is bounded. Oh man, I gotta tell you, this is a lot less fun than teaching in a classroom, but we're gonna make it. There's all kinds of good stuff down here. I wish you guys were here. We've got like an old tank costume for my, well, I guess he was six at the time. Of course that required like 17 hours of work and he wore it for all of like 32 minutes, but you know, free candy. There's just an endless supply of things down here. Stuff that I really, really should throw away. All right, moving on. And you know, I don't know if anyone's been to the grocery store since this whole thing has gotten really crazy, but of course, in here in the state of Indiana, uh, we've got a lockdown that's starting for two weeks tonight at midnight, and so today was sort of your last day to go out and, you know, do whatever you needed to do without having to kind of justify yourself, possibly. Uh, and the grocery stores are out of the strangest things. I mean, some things are predictable, frozen orange juice and bread and eggs and that kind of thing, but then the other thing that was utterly wiped out was pancake mix. So apparently in times of stress, people really like to have pancakes on hand. Okay, let's do a few more examples here. Um, so let's consider once again, geometric series uh, and what I claim so we already saw that if the absolute value of R is strictly less than 1 um, then you can prove that this thing actually converges and it converges to 1 over 1 minus R um, so here we're just going to observe that this guy diverges if the absolute value of r is greater than or equal to 1, since, and this gives me a chance to remind you of the theorem at the end of the last class, right? So what did we see in the last class? We saw that if a series converges, then it has to be the case that the terms in the series, the terms in the sequence that generate the series, they have to go to 0. That's the only way things can work. Right? But of course here, if the absolute value of R is greater than or equal to 1, since in this case, R to the n definitely does not go to 0. Okay? So that's an example of an application of the theorem from the n of the last class. Ah, uh, let's see. Um, let's look at, so this is a very important series, it turns out. So we're going to look at the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n. Okay? Uh, and this guy is important enough that it gets a name. It's called the harmonic series. And it's sort of impressive in a way that it gets a name because it turns out that this series does not converge. Okay? The reason it gets a name, the reason it's kind of famous, 
um, is that this series is in some sense kind of like the dividing line between good and evil. Okay, roughly, and this is not a theorem, this is just a kind of philosophical statement. Um, roughly speaking, if you have a sequence that goes to zero faster, substantially faster than one over n, then probably the series converges. If it goes to zero slower than one over n, then the series will diverge. Um, that analogy really only applies to series that are generated by sequences of non-negative numbers, okay? So once the numbers in the generating sequence start to be possibly negative, then all kinds of strange things can happen. Um, but this particular guy here, the so-called harmonic series, diverges. So let's see why that's the case. Okay, so um, let's uh, suppose suppose it does converge. Okay, what I'm going to do is derive a contradiction. I'm basically going to show that this this cannot be the case. Um, so then S is equal to 1 plus 1 half plus um, 1 third plus 1 quarter plus uh, 1 fifth plus 1 sixth plus 1 seventh plus 1 eighth plus dot dot dot, okay? And you might ask, why are you grouping these things together, okay? So it's clear that S, if indeed it converges, has to be equal to the sum of this list of fractions, but the point of grouping things together as such is that if you look inside any one of these brackets, so here I have a third and a quarter, right? This quantity here is bigger than one half, right? Because one third is bigger than a quarter, and a quarter plus a quarter is a half. Similarly, over here, inside this bracket here, each one of the terms in the bracket, one fifth, one sixth, one seventh, and one eighth, they're each greater than or equal to one eighth, and there are four of them. So if you add up something bigger than an eighth four times, you get something again which is bigger than one half. And you can keep on doing this. So then you would take the next eight terms in the sequence. There will be eight of the next fractions in the sequence. And the sum of all those would be greater than or equal to 8 times 1 over 16, or again, a half, right? And so what you get is that S has to be greater than 1 plus N times a half for any N, right? Because this goes on forever. I can keep up, keep on adding up these one halves forever, meaning that whatever this mess is, it's certainly bigger than one plus n over two for any n. Okay, and that is a contradiction. You cannot have a real number s which is bigger than one plus n over two for any n. Okay. A contradiction. So 
this guy, the harmonic series diverges. Okay. So that's a very important example of a series that diverges. Uh, this next example is related. We won't go through the whole proof, but it's worth mentioning. Okay, so it would be the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of what's called the alternating harmonic series. So it looks like the harmonic series, except that now the numerator, instead of just being 1, is minus 1 to the n, meaning that the numerator flips back and forth from minus 1 to 1. And it turns out that this converges. So the fact that the sign of the terms in the generating sequence is alternating gives you enough cancellation to make sure that the partial sums here grow slowly enough that the overall series converges. Uh, and since I don't want to spend, I mean, a class and a half on infinite series is already probably a little more than I wanted to spend, but um, let me give you one more important example, and then one more useful theorem, and then we'll move on. Um, this is another. So the explanation for for why exactly this converges and why this series here also converges. Those can both be found in the textbook and the notes that are posted online tell you exactly which item it's 3.7.6 in the textbook. Okay, so if you're interested in looking at the full proof, um, then it's right there. Uh, but what I will say is that if you have the series generated by the sequence 1 over n to the power of p, uh, then this converges if p is greater than 1. Okay? So, again, this relates back to the little philosophical speech I had about the harmonic series, right? So what's the harmonic series? The harmonic series is exactly this series here, except uh, when p is equal to uh, 1, exactly. And that diverges. But as soon as you increase the power of n to anything beyond 1, then it starts to converge, okay? And one of the most salient examples, and the one in the textbook, which I think is easiest to understand if you really want to get some flavor for why this is true, is the case of 1 over n squared. Okay? It's a very common example. All right. So those are some further examples of series, some that converge, some that diverge. And that's the end of the notes that were posted for... Monday. Okay, so now we're into a new set of notes, but we're still in the same section of the textbook. All right, so now we are still in 3.7. Um, and the only thing I wanted to mention remaining in 3.7 before moving on to chapter 4 is uh, a basic comparison test. So, I will not be super interested on the exam in your ability to prove whether or not various super complicated infinite series converge or diverge. That's kind of computational. We are much more interested in the in the theoretical uh, here. Okay, um, but in keeping with that theme of the theoretical, 
here is one way that you can use. So I've given you some examples of some series that converge. Um, now, if you have some new series, perhaps it looks a little bit like a series that you know something about, but it's not exactly the same. Is it possible to use the series you know something about to determine something about the series which is similar looking? And the answer is, you know, on a good day, yes. Okay, so there are a number of these, but for our purposes, I will call this the comparison test. Okay. So uh, it says, suppose that we have two sequences xn and yn, okay? And suppose that they both consist of non-negative numbers and that xn is always less than or equal to yn. Then there are two things you can say, one the contrapositive of the other. So part A is that if yn converges, then so does xn, okay? And, uh, and then the contrapositive of that statement is that if xn diverges, then so does the series for y. Okay. All right, so if you want convergence, then you want the bigger sequence to generate a convergent series, then the smaller sequence will also have a convergent series. If you want divergence, you want the smaller sequence to generate a divergent series, and that will entail that the series generated by the larger sequence also diverges, okay? Uh, and let's just quickly observe the proof. It's not complicated. So, proof, uh, let's let, uh, whoops, let's let, as usual, S sub K be the sum from N equals one up to K of the XNs. So those are the partial sums for the sequence XN. And let's let, uh, say, R sub K be the partial sums, the sum from n equals 1 up to k of the yn's, right? So the partial sums for xn and yn respectively, all right? <clears throat> now, xn, the series for xn and the series for yn converge if and only if uh, s sub k respectively r sub k converge. That's just the definition of convergence for a series. Okay, so um, also, and this is the important point, we have that 
zero is less equal to s sub k is less equal to r sub k, right? That comes from the fact that each xn is less than or equal to each yn. So if, and so recall in the comparison test, right, we had these two statements, A and B. The first one said, uh, if, if the series for Yn converges, then the series for Xn, sorry. If the series for Yn converges, then the series for Xn should also converge. This second statement was just the contrapositive of the first statement. So in order to prove this theorem, we only need to prove statement A, right? That if Yn converges, so if Yn converges, Um, that means that the sequence RK converges, but in particular, RK is bounded So what does that mean? So SK is bounded and convergent. And that's all you needed, right? The series for XN converges if and only if the sequence of partial sums S sub K converges. If you assume the series for YN converges, then RK, the sequence of partial sums for the YNs, that converges and is therefore bounded. RK is greater than or equal to SK, and therefore SK is bounded. And SK, remember now, is a monotone sequence because all the XNs are greater than or equal to zero. So it's bounded, it's increasing, and therefore it's convergent. Okay? All right, hopefully that makes sense. Now is the point again where I would ask you if you have any questions, but I guess if you do have questions, please feel free to direct them. I mean, to Piazza, to email, even to the YouTube comments if you want. I'll try to keep on top of this stuff. Oh, an administrative point. So I have to apologize when I first tried to uh, make sure that I got a test assignment up there on grade scope, just to make sure that the whole system was working before I put a real assignment up there. Um, initially, the assignment only appeared for the 1130 class, the dash 065 class, and not for the 1230 class, the dash 066 class. That has been corrected. I would ask that please, 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 that you go on to your Blackboard, to Gradescope, and complete this test assignment. Just asks you for your favorite number. Just complete it, submit it. I will give you the five points toward your total homework score for it. I just want to make sure that everyone is able to submit assignments, okay? And I think last time I checked, there were only about 22 submitted from the 1130 class, so please the deadline technically is tomorrow at midnight. I probably should have made it tonight at midnight. But anyway, please do try to get to that because it makes me nervous if I, I don't know that you are able uh, to submit your assignments. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention, uh, so let me write this down. Gradescope sign up. Um, so when I first sent out an email about signing up for Gradescope, I, in an effort to be as complete as possible, sent out three different ways to identify your section of the course. One of them was the course name. The other was the course number as assigned by Gradescope's internal system. And the last one was an entry code, which is something generated by uh, Gradescope. And 
it turns out that <laughs> for whatever reason, depending on which of those three methods you use to find the course, it might or might not have sent you to quite the right course enrollment for Gradescope. So, what I would like for you to do is make sure when you go into Gradescope that you um, are signed up for the correct course. And in fact, aha, see, here, here folks, is the beauty of being at home. I forgot something, but it's upstairs. Just imagine a musical interlude. I will be back in like 36 seconds. All right, it worked. And in fact, it was a good thing I left too because there was an errant teenager at the top of the steps. I have been trying to get rid of him for weeks. I've tried it all. Rat poison, loud noises. It's still there. Eats everything. All right. So, let me put this information down again. Ah. 11.30, if you are in the 11.30 class, okay, then once you have enrolled in Gradescope, the course name should pop up as this weird kind of uh, alphanumeric code, 2212321. Dot two zero two zero three zero. Okay. Um, this information is in the email that I sent out. But to enroll, I think the safest thing to use is the entry code. And the entry code for that class is nine delta. Say for G, Giga, I don't know. John, Kappa, William, I don't know. So it's this alphanumeric code 9DGJKW. Okay? So that's what you should sign up for if you are in the 1130 AM class. Okay? And it should show one assignment. The title of that assignment should be test assignment. And the content of that assignment should be just something asking you what is your favorite number. Okay, so please submit that assignment. And if you're in the 1230 class, okay, then there is a different alphanumeric code for the class that should pop up once you are enrolled. One, two, nine, eight, nine dot two zero two zero two zero okay and that class also has its own entry code okay and that entry code is nine G G three X six. Okay. So please, please go to grade scope, enroll in the relevant section, check that there is a single assignment entitled test assignment in there and complete that assignment and submit it. Technically the deadline is not till tomorrow at midnight. It would be great. The sooner you do it, the better. Okay. Uh, because as of Thursday morning, I will be posting the first post-spring break assignment, one that will ultimately be graded by the TA. And, uh, and uh, 
so I want to make sure that everyone is on the same page. If you have problems, once again, feel free to email me at my usual email address or post something on Piazza. Emailing me directly is probably the best thing to do. Okay, all right, that's the end of the uh, administrative spiel. Okay, so that's the end of chapter three. That's the end of chapter three. Now we are on to chapter four. And then we will start, of course, with section 4.1, which is on limits of functions, okay? Right, so limits in the sense that you were probably first introduced to them, right, way back in calculus or even pre-calculus, you know, looking at the limit as x approaches c of little f of x, you know, does that limit exist or not? If so, how can we compute it, okay? So I guess, the big question for us initially is, what does the limit as x approaches c of f of x mean? Right? And by that I mean, you know, what what is an official airtight technical definition? of what this limit means, right? We all have some kind of impression, hopefully a very good impression, of roughly what it means. It's what the function f of x is approaching as x approaches the number c, okay? But there are a number of things here that we need to iron out. Um, and the very first thing we are going to iron out is what, what are the possibilities for c, okay? When does it even make sense to ask this question? right? What is the limit as x approaches c of f of x? Because if, for instance, I just take a function f of x, uh, let me, let me actually just write it down. And I'll wave my hands. So here's the example I had in mind. So does the limit, let's say as x approaches minus five of the square root of x make sense? And I guess I should add for anyone who's gonna get picky, I mean among the real numbers. Okay, so yes, if you're allowed to take the square root of negative numbers, and this makes sense and so on. But the point I'm trying to make here is that if we're just working with the real numbers, the square root function, right, its domain is all of the real numbers that are greater than or equal to zero. And therefore, I mean, not only is it tricky to figure out what this limit would be, it doesn't even really make sense. Why would you even ask what this function is doing as x approaches a number which is not even in its domain, okay? So does this make sense? No. On the other hand, right, so my argument here was just that, well, minus five is, is pretty far beyond the pale. It's way outside the domain of this function square root of x. Um, you could ask this, does the limit 
as x approaches zero, and here I'll cheat a bit and use some notation that should be familiar from calculus. Or well, no, let's not. Let's look at the limit as x approaches zero of the function one over x. Does, on the other hand, this limit make sense? Does it make sense to even ask this? And I would argue that, uh, that, that yes, it does. Because the limit, right, what do we tell you over and over again? The limit is supposed to be what the function is doing as x gets really, really close to 0, but is not equal to 0, right? And for any number x other than 0, I can tell you exactly what this function is doing. You give me a non-zero number, I can plug it in here and tell you the value of the function. So if you want me to get really, really close to 0, I can find you all the function values you want of 1 over x really close to 0. In some sense, I should be able to tell you whether this limit makes sense. I mean, maybe it doesn't exist. Of course, it doesn't exist in the end because from the right it blows up to plus infinity and from the left it goes to minus infinity. However, it's not because we don't know anything about how the function behaves near zero. Okay, It's just because the function behaves kind of badly near zero. Okay, So on the one hand, the argument is that this limit up here doesn't make sense at all because minus 5 is definitely not in the domain of the square root function. On the other hand, well, 0 is not in the domain of this function, but it still does seem pretty reasonable for us to ask what happens to that function as x approaches 0. So the difference <coughs> between minus 5 as it relates to the domain of the square root of x and 0 as it relates to the domain of 1 over x is that zero is an example of what we call a cluster point. Okay, It is a cluster point of the domain of the function 1 over x. What that really means is it's a point which, even though it's not necessarily in the domain of your function, it's a point you can get as close as you want to using points from the domain of the function. Whereas minus 5 is definitely not a point that you can get close to by using points from the domain of the function square root of x, right? No non-negative reals will ever get you particularly close to minus 5. Um, and so that's the first concept that we're going to define uh, in limits and I think, let me write down the definition and then we will start the next class by writing the definition down again, okay? At the risk of running slightly over time here. I mean, I suppose it's not like any of us are going anywhere. Uh, so, definition. A number C, a real number C, is a cluster point of a subset of the real numbers, capital A, if for any epsilon greater than zero, there is an x belonging to the set capital A such that two things are true. The first is that x is not equal to c. I want a point different from this, what I hope to be a cluster point of A. So x is not equal to C and nevertheless 
x is very close to c in the sense that the absolute value of x minus c is less than epsilon. Okay, so the idea here is that you're supposed to be thinking of this capital A here as the domain of the function, little f, from the previous chalkboard. Okay, and then this c is a point in the domain, a cluster point, which means it's a point you can get as close as you want to using points from A. Moreover, using points from A that are not the same as C. Okay, so you can get a whole bunch of points getting closer and closer and closer to C that all belong to A. Those are the points, the cluster points, for which it's going to make sense to ask what is the limit as x approaches C of little f of x. Okay, so I will cut it there and um, tune in next time and feel free to send any questions or comments my way. All right, bye, stay safe, wash your hands.